Um, and then finally, questions and answers. Okay, so just a reminder, on the screen, there is a box for your questions, type it in there. Myself and Nancy will go through the list and address the ones that we can do in the time that's still available. Okay, so uh, Nancy, have you got the question screen? Uh, or so I do. It's, it's a little hard to get to them because it's only one line at a time. But um, I looked at a couple of them. One of the questions relates to the issue of dynamic control. Uh, could it be used for analysis of systems whose behavior changes at runtime? That is the dynamic behavior is autonomous. Oh, perfect for that kind of system. That's exactly when you need a control system. Think about it. Control theory is exactly that. Control theory says we control things and we get feedback and we control uh, their behavior without necessarily knowing beforehand being able to predefine what their behavior is going to be. This is absolutely perfect for that. We have examples of systems of us doing that. Somebody asked if it's possible to get a copy of this presentation. Sure. Um, I, similar ones are up on the website, um, but I'm sure that Simon can figure out how to, it's fine with me. Yeah. Um, okay. We already have some of them in the past workshops, because I do a presentation like this at the beginning of each of the workshops during the tutorials. Let me see. Let me go backward. Um, I have to leave on the dot. <laughs> For another meeting, any leads to automotive resources really welcome. Yes. Oh, somebody is already a convert. Oh, wonderful. Um, <laughs> We've been doing a lot of automotive. It turns out the automotive, you know, automobiles today have 100 million lines of software in them. They're astoundingly complex. They're much more complex than jet fighters. I mean, we're doing this on military equipment, but the, the autos in, in, in reality are actually more complex. And so we've been doing this for years. We have lots of contracts and um, with automobile companies. Uh, many of them are talking to us now are at the point where, okay, how do you help us train all of our engineers on this. Uh, it started with just research. We've shown how to fix things like the, deal with things like the feature interaction. They keep adding new features on the, on the automobiles and it turns out each of them is safe in itself and you put them together and you have horrible things like you get out of the car and the car takes off by itself uh, and weird, weird things. So we can identify them and we can actually um, um, deal with these. Um, so, uh, let's see. Many message really resonate with me. Oh, I think I already answered this one. Are there ones? Let me see if I. I don't know how to get Simon. Are there other ones I can't yeah, there's see? A few, the, there's a few. If you scroll uh, up the right hand side um, of that window. Um, okay. I, Where you, can we learn more about the security variant? Uh, very good question. We have a paper, a, a couple papers up at, in the website. There's not a lot. Um, we're doing more and more with security. Um, there have been lots of demonstration projects, but as you can imagine, they're classified. <laughs> so it's very hard. We have a general paper that explains it and how you can do a integrated thing. And it's very short. It's only about six, seven pages, so it's blessedly short for me. Um, but most of the, uh, the examples are, unfortunately, um, classified. Uh, you know, this is being done by the DOD on some of their missions, uh, really most secret missions. But um, the dissertation I talked about is going to be finished in a couple weeks or I murder him because he's just, he's really taking too long to finish this. He's so busy teaching people. Um, but uh, the dissertation has scrubbed examples um, and we're going to try and get more of those out. And of course, this, this dissertation will be available as soon as he finishes it and I accept the final version. Uh, since the Swiss cheese model, um, have you considered any synergy would be your tools related to organizational accident theory? Okay. Uh, well, the Swiss cheese model is the old reductionist approach. 
Um, it looks fancy. It's just the old domino model. It's each of those barriers is a failure, and there's some randomness about whether the, the holes all line up. It's just a chain of events with random failure in a much more sexy, pretty method. And if you notice, at the end is always the actor, the, the pilot is blamed for everything. I mean, James Reed is a psychologist, and you know the wings could fall off the plane, and, and the pilot will still be blamed in the Swiss cheese model. Um, and in, in human factors and analysis methods like HFACs that come from it. So there's not really synergy with, with that. Organizational accident model, uh, accident theory, I think much of it is wrong. It's done by management types like high reliability organizations. I can tell you the, the organization, the company that uses high reliability organization theory to the T, they have a vice president that makes sure they do everything in it, and that's a BP which is the worst accident record in the world. It's never been validated. Uh, we have a paper on the website uh, describing why it's wrong, in case you're interested. But we are doing a lot of organizational analysis. The first one was about 10 years ago on NASA, after the, after the uh, Columbia, NASA uh, uh, introduced a new organizational design for safety and uh, managing safety in the, in the op shuttle operations program, and we did a risk assessment for them using this stuff. It was very early. Uh, it's on the website, but it's very early, so it's not as sophisticated as the ones we do now. I just finished one. I have to be very careful about what I say. For a very, very large aerospace company, but there's several, the, many that fit in that, that category. And we did it on their engineering organization, and it's working great. They are so excited about it and how to change. We did a cultural analysis to understand at what culture, what changes need to be made in the culture in order to get better results from engineering. Um, are there more types of complexity? Actually, there are different types of complexity. I've, I've done that, talk about that sometimes. Um, interactive complexity is one. Another type of complexity is dynamic complexity. One of the questions earlier was about dynamic nature of systems. Uh, because things are changing dynamically, that makes things much more complex. We can handle that. that. Um, I've given some talks, academic talks, about the types of complexity. Um, but I'm not sure that that's, uh, we need to go into there. What about human performance variability and modeling it? Ah, absolutely. So what we can do now, what I showed you now, is really situation awareness. That process model, in humans we call it a mental model, is really related to uh, problems that occur in situational awareness. And we can identify those beforehand and when they might be catastrophic, and what, how we, how we um, get the information and make sure to the to the human and make sure they notice it and and can process it. So we're actually doing a lot in situation awareness, but we're doing more now. We're looking at mode confusion for humans. We're looking at um, and how do you design the software so the and the avionics. Uh, systems that would happen to do it for aircraft, but we're also, oh, and also air traffic control we're working on. Um, but um, you can do it for a any system, and I have several of my PhD students are interested in human factors, so we're doing a lot more human factor stuff now. Another PhD dissertation we finished in about six months is coordination. How do you coordinate, and this is an Air Force uh, major, he's a fighter pilot, in the Air Force, um, how do you coordinate automated systems and pilots? They're working so closely together on these things. And how do you coordinate the decision making when you're flying an airplane? And how do we get that into the hazard analysis so we can do a better job of designing for it? Hi, Nancy. Just to, just to put a, add to that, um, 
Do you want to tell everybody about your visit to the UK during April to the, uh, is it Human Factors and Ergonomics event? Oh, yeah, I don't, yeah, there's some, some kind of keynote talk I'm giving um, in April. Um, if someone asks me, send me mail. I, I don't. I don't remember. It's in sm some small town in England that's going to be very hard for me to get to. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for helping me. I'm not a great publicist for myself. Um, how can STAMP be applied in drug development, clinical research? Ah, we have done this in clinical develop drug development. We have a paper up on it. We analyze the Viox uh, problems in. Um, uh, in the U United States, um, there's some of in, in actually in my book a little bit about that. Um, there are this year's workshop. There are two healthcare-related uh, presentations: one on drug development by some Europeans, and one on um, cancer diagnosis in the UK, the UK uh, national health s system. Um, We've been doing, I've been doing working with hospitals now in the United States and we're doing a lot with um, checklists with safety in hospital procedures, uh, radiation therapy. Um, so there's a lot of stuff, there is stuff being done. What are the main challenges you encountered in this domain? To be honest, <laughs> um, the main challenge is doctors. And people who already think they know everything about safety, um, and so they say, "Well, if we just fire all the bad doctors, then we'll be." It, that's the problem, and and all of you with your system stuff is just nonsense. Um, that's the biggest problem we we have, but it's a cultural problem, and uh, we have published papers now um, in the Journal of. of um, Patient Safety and the uh, Journal of, Con what is it, uh, Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, because we've done it on some surgical systems at major hospitals. Um, we have some stuff on radiotherapy coming out. Um, will the slides be available? Yes. With the oral spoken text? Well, yes, if the, if the recording. This is our first time doing a webinar. But we've been promised the recording will work, right, Simon? Yeah, about. Um, so <laughs> we'll tell you after we we, yeah. we finish this and go try and, and play back the recording. <laughs> so theoretically, yes, it will be uh, available with the oral text um, from Nancy. How's the approach? Um, handle hazard analysis of controlling actions, interactions take place at different levels of abstraction, uh, peer in the concept and the peer in the component. Um, may affect, this is a long question, uh, may affect high level ones and vice versa. It's a hierarchical structure. So the fact that things are at different levels of the structure doesn't matter because eventually everything at the bottom is controlled by every level up above. Um, but it's controlled more indirectly and the timing's different. The lower levels, the timing, the control becomes very tight within maybe within minutes. Uh, whereas if you when you start getting at the higher hierarchical levels, the control actions are more at the months and years level perhaps. Um, so it's it's a different timing, but in the end everything that's just basic systems theory. Basic everything is controlled. Okay. Just so I know this was a basic in next question. Sorry, I know no, this, can, I oh, just, what? can I just add a little bit to that last question? Um, if I if I take the intent, sure. if I take the intent appropriately, uh, if for example you were I don't know uh, operating a nuclear facility, um, and during the design or concept phase you would develop the high level control structure, identify high level safety requirements, safety constraints, and then they would flow into the design. When you actually change your uh, project phase to say uh, installation or bringing on site nuclear materials, then obviously your control structure will be different. And so uh, you could then re you know, model the new control structure, 
identify any new or changed safety requirements or constraints, and then make sure that they're put in place. Um, so your control structure may change depending on the phase of the project or the system operation that you've got. And STAMP allows you to model all of those control structures and then where they can potentially change or even degrade depending on the phase of the project. Just one second. Okay, good answer. Um, the next question says, I know this is a basic introduction, so maybe be clearer when I understand the process more, but it seems to be an extension of traditional methods rather than a, placement, is a re replacement. Is that correct? I think it's an extension of the causality model. A causality model is a formal, you know, kind of a thing in your mind about how you think accidents are caused. The Swiss cheese model is not a method or a technique, it's it's a model. And this is a model of causality. And the way we attack the problem depends on our model of how why we think the problem occurs. Why do accidents occur? So it is an extension in that respect because the old model says accidents are caused by chains of, of failure events. Uh, this says that's not, that's not enough. It's only a subset and we need to expand the model of causality now that we're getting more complex systems. Um, models are just models and it used to, the old model used to be fine. Now, it's not an extension of the old techniques that were built on them. You, because, for example, fault trees are built on this failure model, you can't use fault trees to find these kinds of problems. That's why in the APRI study and other things, we were the only ones that found the accidents. And this is why we're finding more than all of the others. They're all based on that old model. So you can't expand that, but you can certainly expand the underlying causality model, and that's what it is. Um, not a question per se. I'm afraid I have to leave due to my next appointment rapidly approaching. Oh, thanks. I won't have future events. Um, are there any free access models to the process mentioned? Yes, there's a free access model on our website for STPA. Um, again, I need to update it, but I never have any time. Um, but there are lots of papers, as I say, and the technical reports go into how to do it and have lots of worked examples that are all on the... Cybersecurity traditionally uses a system engineering approach. It's difficult to tell what's different about STPA from the published work. Uh, you need to re you need to read. It, it doesn't use a system engineering approach. It uses a bottom-up fault, tree, fault trees or just uh, tap trees. It uses this bottom-up reliability engineering approach. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to explain that to you in just a minute and without being able to draw pictures and, you know, spend 30 minutes an hour trying to show you what's different. It is totally different when you see it than what's done now. And as I said, that short little paper by Bill Young and myself on my webs on our website uh, should help with that. I have to quit, that, come back. Uh, sorry, Nancy, is that something that we could perhaps uh, have as a topic for a future webinar that's more focused on cyber safety at cyber security? Perhaps. Oh, so perhaps what? Uh, do you think uh, that could be a topic of a future webinar? Cyber security. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we can do, I can bring other people in, I can bring my student, he's wonderful, uh, Colonel Young. Um, somebody suggested Googling STPA-SEC for, for the paper, um, so apparently you can see it. Um, all of these are, are not really questions. What's the difference between AxiMap an accident analysis based on stamp. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I am a great follower of Rasmussen. Rasmus, Jens Rasmussen in Europe uh, really is sort of the father of, in Europe at least, of this kind of systems approach to safety. And uh, in the U.S., it, it grew up in the missile defense industry, but 
nobody ever heard about it outside the industry because everything was sort of secret. Jens wrote more public papers. Um, and AxiMap comes from Jens' idea. Um, it's a subset of, I expanded Jens' model that AxiMap is based on. Uh, and there's a little in my book about that, how I extended it. Um, there have been some comparisons with AxiMap, and it just, it's, it's, there's some, some advantages in that everything fits on one page usually, but the problem is it fits on one page because so much stuff is left out. So I've never, I, I think that it's better than AxiMap. The Dutch Safety Agency, which is like the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB in the United States, uh, did a comparative analysis, AxiMap stamp, um, or in the tool called CAST, and um, uh, some others, and decided that they liked CAST the best, so you'll have to see. Um, hello, Embraer Stamp Research. Oh, somebody here, working group is already here. Aha, saying hello. Um, Both considering system theory, aren't they? Both what? Do you understand that question? I think I think Simon? it's a, a follow-on from the question about AxiMap. Um, so, what's the difference between AxiMap and uh, CAST? Absolutely. And they are both based on system theory, but uh, the model of causality in Stamp is expanded beyond that of the model of causality in Rasmussen's original uh, model, which was in his 1997 paper. I actually just wrote a, published a paper on this called The Legacy of Rasmussen. I didn't talk about Aximat directly, but I did talk about how all this comes from Rasmussen's theory. If anyone's interested, it's up on my website. Um, but um, they are both systems theory, and I certainly think AxiMap is much better and much uh, better than the um, uh, than the things people are using in root cause analysis, uh, which now are basically chain of event models that you just follow back in the chain until you you find someone you can blame it on, and then you stop following it back and you label that the root cause. Usually, some kind of operator. Uh, I talk about that in the book. Um, so it's just I think that um, we've expanded and we find more causes and we have a, a structured process in CAS that you follow uh, and you get more out of it. Great to have a talk on different types of complexity. Nancy, right. Nancy. am I supposed to be seeing? Sorry, Nancy. Oh, so was... uh, could you could you make a comment about uh, bow tie analysis in the context of what you've just said about CAS? What kind of analysis? A bow tie analysis. Oh, a bow tie is, is back in 1970. It's one of those old methods. All they did was tie a fault tree with an, with an event tree. You know, tie a forward chain with a backward chain. There's You're going to miss everything on that. I've seen those. They, they The process industry uses them. Um, the process, the petroleum and gas industry has been the hardest nut to crack in terms of getting interest, and I just ignored them. I, I have enough going on. I didn't really need to go chase people who didn't want, want me around. Um, but they're starting to come to me. And uh, the boat, because bow tie has, a, has serious limitations, and bow tie is just is, is the oldest, naivest type of thing, and it's going to catch almost nothing in terms of systemic factors. It's just a chain of events, forward and backward, from some point. Oh, Simon's going to give a talk on this, isn't he? Are you going to say you like it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't want to upset too many people that use it, but personally, I think uh, it's a complete waste of time, and everybody should be using STPA and CAST. But well, that's, you know, I won't be too controversial about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, when you know the analysis is complete, great question. How deep should we go in the analysis? How can we deal with a very complex system in terms of time and money, such as analyzing a whole nuclear power plant? Thank you. Great question. 
All right. A bottom-up technique like a FAMIA is enormously expensive and not very effective because you it's bottom up and you have to look at everything and eventually you just run out of resources. You can't look at every failure and see whether it leads to a, um, a hazard. Um, a top-down method, including fault trees, but SDPS top-down is much more efficient. Um, so how do you know it's complete? Well, fault trees only look at failures, but you don't really know when they're complete either. With, with, with what we found in STPA is you keep going down and looking at more causal scenarios or more causes um, as long as you don't have a solution. When you have a nice design solution for the thing, it doesn't really matter uh, that you get all the causes. Um, if I can solve the problem by putting in a, I don't know, an emergency button or something, an emergency stop button, then I don't necessarily need to eliminate every single and identify every single one. So this really allows you to tailor the amount of work you do with what you really need to do and the minimum you need to do. How can we deal with very complex systems in terms of money? Well, you know, I showed you the um, missile defense system, one of the most complex systems. I mean, not only includes all the radars and all the launchers, it also includes all the shipboard stuff like Aegis, which is on runs ship marine, um, submarine uh, launcher systems. I mean, but what you saw was a very high level um, control structure, right, for that ballistic missile intercept system. Now, when we what we can do is see, is there any possibility of this thing causing a problem? Can we just add, for example, a new case in the software? Or do we have to go in down more in depth? And you may have to. Um, if you can't afford to do more, then you have to figure out a way to just deal with it in the best way you can. At that point, you may have to stop and say, okay, we're going to have an emergency stop or we're going to um, call for the Coast Guard um, and we're not necessarily going to prevent every every type of, of, of way that this ship could, could sink because um, it, it really depends on how expensive, how costly, and how catastrophic an accident is as to how much you can spend. How do you analyze a whole nuclear power plant? We've done that. We've got a research report, um, uh, and we didn't do the whole plant. We did uh, the shutdown system, which is what they certify on. This was for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We've gone into nuclear people who are building nuclear power plants, I, I, large utilities, I don't want to, can't give any names because we've promised anonymity to them, um, and uh, we, sh they, they're doing it on their systems, and um, they're, they're finding again much more things that they just didn't know about. In fact, one was close to uh, to releasing a, a, a system. Um, and we went in just to give them a demonstration and sometimes when we go into a company, we'll have them work on their own problem just to show them that are part of their problem for the day. And in just that one day or two days that we did, they found some catastrophic problems in their system, potentially catastrophic. Now. Uh, you know, I can't tell people what to do. Um, we were doing teaching, and they were really concerned because this thing was released, being going to be released in three months, and now they found stuff that they didn't know about and didn't expect. And what they did about, it, I don't even know. And um, just but yes, it can be done on large, large nuclear, near large, very complex systems like a nuclear power plant. Just to add something to that, Nancy, um, I, I have said to a few people that have decided they want to have a go with Stamp, STPA, and CAST, and they have to, they have to, it has to be clear at the outset that when you start using this method, because of its, it is very powerful, 
it is likely that you'll find unpleasant surprises or you'll confirm things which have been suspected. And so when this analysis is done, just be prepared that you might find something, you know, that then needs to be appropriately dealt with. Instead of running around, chase, you know, blaming people for not doing the analysis properly in the first place or, you know, pointing fingers, focus on fixing the issues that have been identified. In fact, in, in the advanced event that we're going to run in October, we haven't, haven't decided yet what form it's going to take. But it is likely that, you know, if a particular organization wants to send a few of their team across to talk about a specific real example, we don't have any problems signing any non-disclosure agreements and working through those examples live. And yeah, we do that too. I mean, um, but, you know, I've gone in and, and what's surprising me is sometimes people will tell me, we can't use this because we're, we're afraid. Our management is afraid we'll find things we don't know about. And our lawyers tell us that we'd have to do something about it. So we don't, we can't, our, our management, we want to use it, but our management won't let us. This is part of the organizational problem <laughs> and culture that I can't deal with. Uh, I want to write a book. Um, one of my next books is going to be about well, workplace safety because we're doing a lot on that, but then also on why safety pays. I mean, management just doesn't understand that safety in the long run pays. It costs an enormous amount if there's an accident, and even finding problems late, you know, basic design problems you find late in the development process during maybe system testing, the cost of making changes at that point can be absolutely enormous and may be prohibitive. Uh, so you do, you put in a little extra redundancy or something because you don't know what else to do and you have to release the system. and um, you know, I, that's this is this is why I'm in a university. I don't have to make those kinds of decisions. <laughs> um, the, the for wiser people than than myself. I just tell people how they can do things and should do things. Whether they do them or not has to be up to them. Um, the next question says, can the stamp part on accident analysis process look at less critical occurrences for aircraft? Oh, sure, any occurrence. Or precursors, yes, I have a paper on leading indicators, how to identify beforehand re precursors so that you can identify when your system is drifting towards states of higher risk. Most accidents, this was a concept by uh, Jens Rasmussen, uh, so this is an original with me, but systems tend to migrate, tend to change over time, and they tend to get more risky as they don't have accidents, people start acting in a different way and making decisions in a different way, and you're under a lot of pre competitive pressure, produ production pressures, and so people start to act more more risky and they don't identify know that they're doing this and so we can identify we have a way of using STPA to identify leading indicators of risk um, assess updated probability of accidents um, I didn't get into this because it's it's so um, um, oh good at least half people have already left so I only offend half of you um, <laughs> This is a religious argument, but I don't believe that it's possible to know what the probability of an accident is. I don't know what the future is. The things I can measure and have a probability for, which is hardware failures, are usually not the cause of my accident. I have been involved in large accident investigations, small one. I've read hundreds of accident reports. Every single one of them had a probabilistic risk assessment that showed that accident could not happen. And in fact, one of the contributing causes was that they didn't do anything about it because they proved it couldn't happen. So many of those probabilities are just um, wishful thinking. Sometimes they're uh, based on politics. Uh, you want to do as little work as possible, so you, you make the likelihood as low as you can. Um, we have in this, this um, 
in the Blackhawk helicopter one I told you we just published, we found lots of things that they had said likelihood was marginal. The risk was, was really low of an accident, so they didn't have to do more. And we, using STPA, found cat past the catastrophic accidents that were perfectly reasonable. Um, and we, can sh we compared that. Um, so I'm not sure I believe that we can even know what the probability of an accident is. Um, I just don't have a crystal ball about how people are going to behave in the future, how the environment's going to behave in the future. We can try and predict these things, but we're not very good at it, to be honest. There's something called heuristic biases, and they make a, and basically it's a scientific, um, uh, psychological, I'm sorry, psychological principles that say that humans are really bad at estimating probabilities and risks. Um, and act, identify actions to be taken before the accident occurs, absolutely. And that's what SCPA is. I mean, you either look at an accident after the fact, identify all the causes, and then try and fix them all instead of just blaming it on the operator, firing him, say, we'll train them better to not make that ac that mistake. Um, or you can beforehand identify um, and prevent the accident. Okay, is it possible to have a talk on how to address organizational culture? Absolutely. Uh, I haven't written this up. It's so new. I'm in the middle of writing a paper on it. Um, but yes, definitely. Uh, Simon, could you please collate links? Uh, okay, these are. Uh, yes, yes, I'll be doing that in the post webinar uh, follow up. So I'll be sending an email out with uh, all that information and also I'll send out a post webinar survey. So if you'd be kind enough to fill that in, I'd really appreciate it. Ah, I have somebody saying hello to me, but I can't see his full name. <laughs> And a little Simon. All right. How do you know we are applying the analysis correctly? Um, well, that's um, a good question. That's true. Most analysis methods, most of the fault trees I see are utter rubbish in 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 practice. People aren't very good at that. Um, so. Um, I, I guess. Um, you need to um, get some training. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how to answer that because I don't know how to do that for any analysis method. How do you know you're applying it correctly? Um, um, I could add, I could uh, add, I could add something to that. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> when, when you're doing the when you're creating the hierarchical control structure, you're modeling your system. Um, Essentially, it's intuitive. So depending what you define as your system and who the different people are that are involved and the different technical aspects, when you put that model together, you will get a good feel as to whether that is a, a reasonable model. And so when you analyze that model and you cover all the bases, effectively that shows that you have a, a complete analysis. But obviously, you've got to keep in mind that you know models are useful, but all models are wrong. So as long as you recognize those limitations, then you should have a, a good quality analysis. Oh, that's a good answer, Simon. The other answer um, is that you never just do. I would never have a safety anal analyst, and including myself, a safety engineer, just go do the analysis and say it's done. I always go to experts on the system. The expert engineers need to at least be able to review these things and say, yes, that's right, no, that's wrong. One of the things in workplace safety, a revolutionary idea, we actually ask the workers <laughs> why they would make certain mistakes and what mistakes they make. Uh, it was amazing what they came up with. Um, they know, and but usually we, we engineers who have never put a plane together or an automobile together, assembled one, um, thinks that we can do all the analysis for for the people who are actually doing it, the real experts. And that's that's just not realistic. So we should always have uh, other people reviewing 
our analyses and real experts on the system to make sure that the analyses make sense. Does Nancy or have I know or collaborate with somebody who I've never heard of? Sorry, I've never heard of that person, so they want to know what I think of his take on human stuff, but I've never heard of him. Um, major problem with, is that you get no feedback regarding how successful it is. Accidents uh, do not help, of course. Does FAMP consider this? If so, how? Um, absolutely. That's part of my leading indicators, too. Um, let me give you an idea. I define leading indicators as failed assumptions. Accidents occur often, usually, when you you tried to build a safe system and you made certain assumptions about how it would behave or what would happen, um, and you took care of those. Uh, and usually you took care of them okay. Accidents occur when the assumptions you made during your development and design and, and operation don't, aren't realistic. So what I mean by a leading indicator is a check to see whether your assumptions that you made in your analysis actually are still true. And so, um, so yes, we absolutely do consider uh, the issue of uh, looking at feedback on how successful it is. Um, and it's part of our whole process, in fact built in for building leading indicators and risk management and part of my new risk management ideas. Um, is there anything else? I recommend any books for starters, especially STPA. Oh, well, the first starter is my book. Uh, engineering a safer world is really the basis for all of this. Now, STPA was still being developed at that time. It's not the best reference for STPA, but it's definitely a reference for in general. Uh, we have a primer. We haven't um, created any books uh, because we're, as we learn, we want to change it. One of the problems with writing a book is then you change your you find out something needs to be changed and you can never change it. Um, so we, it, we have a living book on the website and that's all I can really suggest all, and all the papers we have, lots of them. What is the paper on how to identify precursors? It's up on my website. Thank you for elaborating. Uh, and precursors mean on identifying tends to go toward Rasmussen boundary of safety. Absolutely. So someone has read Rasmussen and said and asking I think asking is the is this what I mean what Rasmussen meant by going toward the boundaries of safety yes but I don't think of them as quite boundaries in, in quite the same way um, it's constraints that aren't being satisfied uh, so I define it the whole thing using a very system theoretic method is we're, we're identifying constraints on the behavior of the system and when we don't um, enforce those constraints on the behavior, then we have we start going toward accidents and have it increasing the likelihood of accidents. Um, uh, all analog tools have limitations. Are there any other approaches that think pair well with SDPA to maximize coverage? You know, I wish there were more new new techniques. Um, most of what I see is people in universities who have never tried it on any real system, never used it in the industry, and frankly have never worked on a real system, and they make up some kind of new tool, and nobody ever uses it, and nobody ever has used it. Um, and most of them don't seem very useful to me. Um, you know, I worked on I worked in this field for 36 years, so I and on real systems. I have I have always worked outside the university and worked on on various kinds of real really complex system, engineered systems. So, um, I, I wish there were better other tools. Most of this stuff's old. Uh, has up. We've seen that uh, SCPA just replaces has up, and for me and others, a um, I don't know whether they want me to say their name. They said this at a public meeting in Japan, but I don't know. One of the Japanese companies um, said that they were usually used, they were traditionally used for me. And we first 
met with them and showed them how to use SDPA, they said, well, we're not going to give up the MIA. Uh, we'll use this in addition. And we said, fine, whatever you want. All we're here, you asked us to show you how to use it, we're telling you. Uh, and last year at a meeting, another meeting in Japan, someone from the same company stood up and said, we're not going to do FAMIA anymore because we found that STPA finds everything done by FAMIA and FAMIA is so expensive. Uh, so I don't, I can't answer that question. I wish there were some better tools. Um, <laughs> to use. There certainly we have tools at different points in the life cycle. A STECA is probably most appropriate very early in the life cycle. STPA a little bit later, uh, although still in the early design stages. Um, I wish people came up with things that I really liked. I haven't seen anything that I thought worked because they don't seem to have any theoretical model underneath what they're doing that that justifies what they're doing. They just make up something and say, well, you know, I like event network analysis, so I'm going to claim that we can do a network anal safety analysis using network analysis. Well, why? I mean, th there has to be some rationale connecting this network analysis to the cause of accidents, or you're just writing a paper. So, sorry. I think that's the end. Well, there is a... I mean, we can we can end it there, but there are a few questions that arrived during your when you were talking. Um, so we can oh. I think there's probably four or five of those that we can just quickly jump to. Um, if you scroll scroll up the questions window to 1426, uh, Frank he's asked a question about the SIL concept, which I think is worthy of a uh, worthy of discussion. What, where is this? See, I don't see that, oh, right. um, unfortunately. I can only see one line of questions at oh, a time. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, they're not numbered. I don't know if you can resize your window, stretch it horizontally, but there's like a, a time when the, when the question was received, and it was received at 26 minutes past two. Um, I mean, I can just read it out uh, to you. I don't have that date. See, you have all kinds of information I don't seem to have. <laughs> oh, fine. I can open this window? Oh, I can open this window. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I've opened it that way. I wish I could make it bigger, but I can't seem to get more than one question. But I did at least get it horizontally bigger. Um, there's a little sort of horizontal bar at the bottom. So what time? Okay. So give me a time. Uh, 1426. I can see the time now. 1426. 14, I only go up to 1103. <laughs> Um, so we, oh, I think sorry, we're in different boss. time yeah. zones. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Eleven twenty-six, and it's Frank uh, from Belgium. Eleven twenty-six. Oh, yeah. okay. So, sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, I only, oh, no, I only go up to eleven twenty-two. Uh, so it's it's, it's eleven twenty-four now here. So this would be the future. Oh, right. Hang on then. Try 926. 0926. 25 past 9. Uh, 9? Seven. Oh, that's yeah. way back. Sorry. Okay, let me. I'm trying. This is actually nice software, but it, there's a few things that they could improve. The, the human machine interface. <laughs> and this is one of them. <laughs> yeah, 0926. Uh, Frank uh, from Belgium. He's, uh, he's asked about the SIL concept. Uh, the SIL concept is technically meaningless, I think he's quoted you saying. Um, is that? Oh, yeah, I do. I do get everyone angry <laughs> with that one. Is that true <laughs> for every uh, SIF, safety integrated function? Okay, so uh, the SIL, yeah. Um, I, I debated not even mentioning it, and then I decided this would get everybody awake, um, if nothing else. Um, the SIL says that the SIL is applied to the software, right, to the component. How can you ever know about the safety of a component outside of the system in which it's operating? So this is the example of the Ariane 4 and 5, the exact same software. One worked perfectly well in the Ariane 4, but because the Ariane 5 took off at a higher trajectory, 
it blew up. Software ended up in an explosion of the Ariane 5 on the first flight. Um, the problem is safety is an emergent system property. SIL is really looking at reliability, and they're looking at the reli component reliability. And it's assuming that component reliability is equal to system safety, and it isn't. And that's what the whole part of this first thing and why I go through all of that business about reliability and things. Um, it's, it's, it's a critical assumption um, and a critical concept people have to make if they really want to do something about safety. Um, oh, Ken Hoyme. Oh, I see a name, someone I haven't heard, seen in a long time. Um, so, um, the, the sill, I mean, everybody means well. It's like, remember the little birds on the on the park feeding worms into the baby? Uh, and the baby was still crying. Um, everybody means well, but they're going with this old concept that safety is equal to component reliability. And as I said, a long time ago, before we were building the types of systems we're building today, that was a good um, simplification. It worked because we got the design errors out, uh, system design errors. But now those system design errors are still there when we use the thing. And it doesn't matter how reliable the components are in implementing their requirements if the requirements are wrong, if the system design is flawed. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's what we really have to have to deal with, um, and that's why the sill doesn't make any sense. Now, um, people are two six two six two in the automotive industry really comes from IEC sixteen six fifteen zero eight, which is where the sill came from, uh, and people are recognizing that, and uh, they're just trying to add STPA into two six two six two. And they're adding it. We're trying, you know, they're trying to get it added into the standards so they can do something that makes a little more sense. Um, if if you want to use SIL, you're perfectly willing, to, welcome to. Uh, but I do have a recommend that you buy a lot of insurance. Hi, Nancy. Did you want to address Rick Stryker's question at for uh, 0957? Are there situations less complex where you would recommend using the old tool sets or can stamp be applied across all situations? 957. Oh, I've got it. Um, are there situations less complex where you recommend and use? Well, um, certainly the in less complex systems, which means probably systems without any software in them, if you have any, you can think of any today. Uh, I used to say a bicycle, but bicycles now have soft computers in them, microprocessors in them. If you have a really simple system, uh, you can get away with the old methods, but they cost more than STPA. Stamp STPA works on all these, and they're going to be less costly. But if you want to spend more money and do the old stuff, um, sure. As long as it's very simple, but the problem is it has to be really simple. And what we sometimes think of as simple is not so simple after all. There are system design errors in most, in many of these systems that appear simple to us, but we can't exhaustively test. If you can exhaustively test the system, then sure, then you can get out all the design errors beforehand, and I'm happy. Uh, you can use anything you want. Um, you probably don't need any hazard analysis technique for those. You just need to make all the components pretty redundant and reliable. Uh, and you don't need an analysis technique. Uh, but there's not many of those systems around today. I, I don't, can't think of any. As I said, bicycles are now. Um, people have used stamp on, on fairly simple systems and found things that nobody had thought of. I think it's really interesting where um, after the Toyota unintended acceleration accident, 
the chief engineer of Toyota was quoted in the newspaper as saying, it can't, be, it's got to be the floor mats or something, it can't be our, our operator air, it can't be our system because we have exhaustively tested our, our software. Oh, is he, I hope he was just trying to make the, that he didn't believe this um, because you don't exhaustively test, you know, tens of thousands of, of lines of, so, tens of millions, I'm sorry, tens of millions of lines, of, you don't exhaustively test tens of lines, tens of thousands of lines of software, you let alone tens of millions. Um, and and <clears throat> engineers misunderstand this though. They have this belief that they're exhaustively testing when I don't think they really are. Well, I know they aren't. They just don't know it. <laughs> should, we, should we take one final question from Steve Lilly at 1506? Um, it's about unsafe control actions. So in the STPA primer, um, it mentions a fifth scenario, control action required is provided but not followed. Um, oh, yeah. Yes, I didn't, I, it's actually on one of the slides, but I didn't want to, it was gained so long, the more than the, so much more than the 45 minutes Simon promised that um, I skipped it really quickly. Um, absolutely. So it's not only unsafe control actions, uh, the, op, the, the software could, or the human could do exactly the right thing. They could give out a safe control action and it may not be implemented correctly. And so absolutely you have to do that. And in fact, those are the things that the standard techniques find. The failures of the actuators, the failures of the components, uh, you know, the physical hardware components of the plane or of the device, whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, you do have to do that. It's just, um, it's, I, I, I didn't include it because it's usually pretty straightforward, but uh, sorry, I went over that too fast. That's fine. Okay, well, somebody's obviously read the primer. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Are you sort of happy now with the questions and answers? Should we, should we call that a day and let everybody get back to their busy schedules? <laughs> what was that? I'm sorry. Should we call that to uh, the end and uh, give everybody, you know, thank you for coming and uh, you're welcome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Some of you have stayed. It's amazing. Um, this has been a long time. We, we certainly... Um, I've been wanting to do something like this and Simon sort of came and asked me and I thought, oh yeah, that's wonderful, but you know, I'm, so, I'm actually a technological nerd when it comes to computers and um, I, I'm really bad at all this software, so I thought, well, how am I going to do a webinar? So um, I, I think it's great. I'm really excited that Simon did this and I'd certainly like to continue to do this um, kind of thing more and and you know once we have this all recorded and people can look at this then they can we can do more advanced topics because beginners will say okay before you do this you should go look at the past one and now now you're ready to go dig into the techniques but unless you understand why you're doing the such a different paradigm it's really a paradigm change and um, because of that unless you understand the reason for the paradigm change it doesn't make much sense when you just start in details <laughs> oh I forgot my paradigm change slides <laughs> I have a couple slides that I really like that if if everybody will have to take about is be patient for about two minutes while I go get them uh, well, we could stick them in the slide pack and then send those out afterwards, if you like. Uh, no, I need to explain it, I think. Okay. <laughs> just a minute. It's, it's almost, I'm almost there. I just... Okay. <laughs> um, okay, here. So, can you give me the, the screen? Yep, stand by. Okay. So... Sometimes what I, I do, people get scared about paradigm changes. Please close confidential. Oh, show my screen. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Yes, we can okay. see it. Okay. People get 
I scared at the idea of a paradigm change. They they get uh, worried about that they won't be able to understand it, won't be able to keep up. That you know they're familiar with what they've been doing their whole life, and now you're telling them they have to change. Um, and so I want to talk about a paradigm change um, about the whole concept of it. A paradigm change doesn't mean that what you previously did is wrong and the new approach is correct. Einstein had a great quote. He wrote, progress in science is moving from one paradigm to another is like climbing a mountain. The further you move, uh, you move up, you can see farther than on the lower parts of the mountain. The new perspective doesn't invalidate the old one, but it extends and enriches our appreciation of the valleys below. So the value of the new paradigm, in fact, often depends on the ability to accommodate the successes and empirical observations made in the old paradigm. It's not that the old ideas are wrong, but we need to get a better, bigger perspective because the world has changed that we're applying these, these ideas on. So the new paradigms offer a broader, richer perspective for interpreting the previous answers. Isn't that nice? I like that. Anyway, that's Einstein, not me. <laughs> so that's, I think, a good way to stop okay. to end. Simon? I'll, I'll take the uh, screen back. Um, there we go. <clears throat> so I just want to say, you know, first off, thank you to you, Nancy. I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, you know, taking your time out to put together some slides and go through it and particularly answer a lot of the questions. I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of people that have answered, asked questions and I really appreciate your response to that. But I also want to say thank you to all the attendees, because obviously without you guys, we'd have no webinar. We'd have nobody to talk to, no questions to answer or anything. Um, if this is, you know, if this is something that you've enjoyed, please provide some feedback. Uh, you know, please tell your friends and your colleagues about it. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, we are going to run some UK based events. The first two will be well planned will be in October. If there are any any that you'd like to attend earlier than that, please go to the link on the screen, send your details, let me know, and we'll I'll contact you and see what we can organise. And likewise with the webinars, if you'd like to be involved in some more webinars, please go to the link at the top and we'll uh, send you some details about that. But thank you, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you again another time. Bye bye.